chess videos, I have a great chesser size for you. One of my commenters on my videos, Crafty Monk, has played a game against a player who was rated 500 points stronger than he is, and he won. And he told me in his email, he asked me if I would make a video of his game because he was watching my videos and he said, well, yeah, that's, that sounds well and good, but can this stuff that this backyard professor is teaching really work? Well, I know it can because it's not my teaching. It's the Silman Chess Course. It's really nice to see a 1300 rated player beat an 1890 rated player. So I'm going to show you that game. First, I want to introduce you to the opening system that Crafty Monk used in his game. He used the Slav defense. In his book, The Complete Game, The Complete Book of Chess Strategy, Silman discusses the Slav defense and what it's supposed to be accomplishing. I hope that win's not too bad. Man, if it is, I'm going to be mad. I've got my camera set up right against a tree so the wind doesn't blow too bad. I hope, I hope. This is a popular opening among grandmasters even today because it gives a harmonious mix of solidity and dynamism. And that's what everybody wants in chess, right? Dynamic chess. Give us a feel for the Slav defense. D4, D5, C4, C6. The reason this is such a popular move is because black protects his d-pawn, right? But he doesn't hem in his bishop to do it by protecting the d-pawn with his king-pawn. So this is one of the lines of option open in the Slav defense that's really nice. And then play continues. Knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, d takes c4. And then after the D takes the C4, the pawn moves up to A4. So you can see a dynamic play. And this stops Black from holding on to his pawn with the B7, B5 advance later on. But that does leave a big hole at B4. That's part of the, the defect of it. So the bishop will now come to F5. And then e3, e6, so they're both solidifying their center. You'll notice he pulled out his bishop first, his bad bishop, outside the pawn chain. And now from this point, bishop will take the c4 pawn. See how this is developing here? And then bishop comes to b4, way down here, putting the question to the knight with the pin and white castles. And knight b comes to d7. So this is basically the Slav defense. And this position offers many opportunities to both sides, Silman says. He says the uh, white can play to expand in the center. Here, he makes use of his extra pawn center, of course. And if this doesn't appeal to him, he can play with the two bishops by pushing knight to h4 and bringing out his other bishops. So, so this is kind of an interesting thing. Black is going to try to castle and control the b4 square. So black is going to play on the queen side more or less, while white in this system has good possibilities in the center. So this is a brief look at the Slav defense. Okay, so let's take a look at Crafty Monk's game that he played using the Slav defense against his opponent that was rated 500 points higher than he was. This is very cool. It's a typical Slav defense. He's defending his d-pawn with the c-pawn, not the e-pawn. That way he can pull his bishop out if he so desires. And Monk did desire. He pulls his bishop out to f5. Oh, nope, I'm sorry. He didn't do that yet. He pushed the knight. And then the other knight came out to c3, and now Monk pushes the bishop to f5. So he's gotten his bishop outside of the pawn chain. This is beautiful strategy. This is how you want to do this. Now c takes d5 and the knight takes 
D5. So you can see he's already put his knight on a good central outpost. Now, of course, that's not a permanent outpost because he's got the pawn to come up here to actually give him a pretty interesting fork if his opponent so desires. His opponent brings up his queen to b3. Monk put his queen to b6, challenging the queen. So, early on in the game, they swap queens. Monk says he likes to play without the queens. He is very comfortable without the queens, and how he does this is he knows how to play all of the other pieces, which he does demonstrate in this game very interestingly. Now, e4. Now, you can see he's properly doing a central thrust. He is in the slab. The white has the opportunity, or the option, I should say, to produce this kind of a central thrust, and Monk dodges his bishop back down. And now he pulls his knight up. And, of course, he's threatening Monk's bishop. He's going to look to here and to here. The f7 is the weakest square, of course. He doesn't have any bishops out just yet. But he's putting the question to Monk, and Monk puts the e6 up here to give that extra support to the central square, right? And his opponent pulls up f3. Again, you notice how they are centralizing and supporting their center really strong before going off into any kind of wild, hairy hunting. Monk brings his knight up to challenge the knight, and now the knight takes the bishop. And at this point, Monk has a wonderful open file. Here. So you can begin to see some of the imbalances. Now that we analyze this, it's two bishops for white, right? And Monk has the two knights. So he's going to want to try to keep this board closed. At this point, it's a wide open board. There's no pawns that are centrally locked. Uh, Monk has the option to castle. As of yet, white hasn't taken that option to castle yet. But he has it now. He pulls his bishop out here on f4 to, to centralize. And Monk pulls his bishop up to e7. And now his opponent does castle queenside, the long castle. And Monk is pushing his pawn. So now he's going to start challenging again the center here, isn't he? Very interesting how he does this. The bishop drops down because he wants to retain this long, fabulous diagonal, keeping the castle option out of this side. If Monk castles, he's going to have to go to that side. And he appears to me to want to castle that side at this point. We shall see, won't we? Now Monk puts his knight on f6. He wants to involve his entire army as his opponent does. This is critical. I've said this a thousand times. I will continue saying it. Notice how they are bringing in massive development. This is a very excellent way to play chess. And now, let's see, did I do this? Bishop to e2, and now Monk goes knight h5, again challenging that bishop. Bishop pops down to f2, so Monk has forced him to give up the diagonal for the moment. The center is somewhat closed. Uh, the bishops don't have a lot of activity or influence at this point. So at this point, uh, I think they're both pretty... Uh, well, maybe white's a better development, but um, I think Monk has as good a setup for black in the slab as he can here at this point. And he castles long also. Apparently he wanted to castle long. Do you see why? Had he castled short, he wouldn't have had an open file. By castling long, Monk claims a central open file. And now he has this H open file. And white has no open files. So it's looking better and better and better for black here, isn't it? It's a very good castle, I think. 
G3, he's going to start pressing the king's side, and he's going to move his king clear out of the way. He says there's no reason to uh, have it out of the way. Notice the pulling in of all of the members of your army. This is good chess. Notice Monk put his knight on the edge, and there's nothing wrong with that as such, but he wants to bring it in to use his entire army. So he, he's not going to leave it out here in the rim and try to find one or two pieces. He's going to pull it back into the action. It served its purpose at that point. This is always important to keep in mind. He drops his bishop down. Monk put his bishop on b4. Again in the slav, this is, this is somewhat typical to do. And now he's kind of playing on this wing and now he's kind of playing on that wing. It's really cool how he does this. His opponent drops the bishop down to f1, and now he brings the knight back over to here. He pushes the a3 pawn, calling on the bishop, decide what you're going to do. Monk keeps his bishop instead of exchanging the knight down. He keeps his bishop. He's got good central power. He's got good central pawns. I think the, uh, well, the doubled pawns here, uh, they could they could become a target. This, this is a, a weak pawn, but it's certainly easy to strengthen at this point, right? He's got a backward pawn here on b8. Um, and I say backward, it may not be backward, but it has the potential to be backward if he starts fighting for this wing. And the b2 pawn here would be one of Monk's targets. He seems like he's got his army completely in control, the bishops, however, being on the first rank, don't inspire a lot of confidence at this point. Uh, it's kind of interesting to, to see how this is going down. Now, he is going to push the central advance, isn't he? He's pulling up his pawn. This in the Slav defense, this is what you can expect from white, as Silman has noted. And now, Monk has the e5 square, a very good, powerful square right there in the center. His opponent brought his bishop up to g2. Uh, it's, it's behind the pawn chain at this point, so it's not wielding a lot of influence. Monk goes ahead and challenges that pawn chain right up at the front to try to open up the center a little bit. E takes the d5. Now we've got an isolated pawn here. Rook comes to c8, grabbing the other open file directly across from the king. Now, this is, Monk is apparently looking to go for a kingside attack. He's got some options here. D takes e6. Now, instead of focusing on the pawns as such, if Monk was to take that pawn, it would completely obliterate his kingside pawns, wouldn't it? I mean, there'd be a lot of targets and weaknesses here, right? And, I mean, his king isn't exactly out of the way, but he's not in any danger, necessarily. Watch what Monk does. I thought this was an extremely interesting move. He's not following the dictates of his opponent by reacting to everything his opponent does. His opponent has more or less made his bishops... Well, this bishop has pretty good influence. That's not bad. But this one's not doing a lot, you know. He's got all of his army in, and then he kind of tucked his bishops back. And I, I think that's kind of an error. Watch how Monk schools him on how to use his bishops. Monk comes down here and takes a3. And you go, oh, what are you doing, Monk? You're going to just lose your bishop. No. What he's doing is he's prying the king open. And this is very interesting. It's not about material consideration at this point, is it? I mean, in some respects it is, but Monk sniffs a king that can be pried open and is somewhat loose, and he's going to get it. He's got his knight pinned here. This is a real interesting pin. So if he does take the bishop, he's really got a screaming uh, rook take the knight, and then the king is completely exposed and wide open, and Monk could realistically come and get him with those rooks. So this is a power move because Monk paid attention 
to not acquiescing to White's desires and moves, he has the initiative. Monk has the initiative. He's calling the shots. This is one of the critical elements in Silman's chess course. We see Monk doing this very well. However, what's the downside? Well, you see a free knight right there, right? Rook takes the knight, right? That's okay, though, because now Rook takes this knight anyway because look at the beautiful pin he's got on this pawn here. The pawn can't take the rook, and, and he's in check, so the pawn can't take the bishop. That is a beautiful move. He didn't react to this by trying to chase the rook away. He has his own plan, and he's carrying it out. He's coming to get the king. That is absolutely wonderful chess. King comes to b1, rook comes over here to b3. King comes up to a2. Rook takes b2. I mean, he's just, he's got this king right where he... Now, at this point, we see the beauty of the monk setup here, don't we? This is fantastic. This is absolutely fantastic. His opponent came to a1. But you notice why? He can't take the bishop. If he takes that bishop, this game is over. Do you see the move the monk has? This is fantastically set up. If he were to take that bishop, that would be the game. Check and a fork to the rook. That would be pretty much the game. The king can't take his rook either because he's got that covered. That is a fantastic setup that he has done because he has pulled and utilized his entire army out in the field instead of putting him back in the back like his opponent did. This is really fun. Instead, his opponent pulled the king... Whoops, sorry. His opponent pulled his king to A1. And Monk comes over here and picks up a piece, threatening the other piece, although it is covered with the uh, rot file, but he's got another rook to bring on in here with the open files. You notice how Monk has used his open files and his open diagonals with his bishops and rooks. This is excellent. E takes f7. His opponent is seriously hoping to get a queen here. That would be extremely nice for him, wouldn't it? But now bishop comes to b2. Beautiful fork. Check. He's got his rook. And of course, it's not going to matter if he queens anyway because he simply snips it off with the, uh, with the rook. So that is a very, very delightful game to play through that is based on a lot of the Silman imbalances and the idea of reading the board and not just reacting to your opponent because he is 500 points above you in a rating. You know, his opponent was playing some moves here that if Monk had been intimidated by his ratings instead of playing the board, he might have begun to react a little bit to him and he wouldn't have had this wonderful king side opportunity, right? On the queen side, but opportunity of the king. He took the initiative and he never let it go. That's a great chessercise for you to play through. Thanks, Monk, for sending me this game. It's been a delight to play through. It's been fun to make a video of. A great chessercise. Congratulations on beating someone 500 rated points. This shows you that it's not about the rating, is it? It really isn't. It's about the knowledge. It's about the ability to use the pieces properly on the board properly in the proper section of the board, isn't it? You notice Monk's opening with the Slav defense didn't follow the opening lines typical of the Slav defense either. Why is that? Because they never do. If you memorize a bunch of openings, what happens if your opponent plays a move that has nothing to do with the opening? Then you're just lost. 
it's, it's more important to understand general principles, getting your bishops out ahead of the pawn chain, using your bishops in an open field, and using your rooks in files. These are much more important considerations, as well as the fight for the center was pretty good, too, right? So, thanks, Monk, and thanks the rest of you, too, uh, for watching my videos. Happy chessercising and happy chess studying. And I'm missing something. Oh, happy checkmating, of course. Happy checkmating. Or at least forcing the king to resign. <laughs> Way to go, Monk. I'm impressed. I'll see you guys in the next video.